a little out tree. A diggy digga doo, digga doo doo. Digga digga doo, digga doo. Oh, you love me, and I love him. He loves Kim, and Kim loves him. A digga digga doo, digga doo doo. A digga digga doo, digga doo. Oh, I'm so very digga digga doo by nature. Ba 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 doo, ba ba doo, da doo, da doo, da ba ba doo, da. Ba da ba doo, da doo, da da da. Let those diggy people smile. How can there be a plastic child? A digga digga doo, digga doo doo. A digga digga doo, digga doo, yeah.
Thank you.
Melbourne's changed a lot since the early 60s when a young musician arrived here from England, Jerry Humphreys. He played jazz with the Red Onions, then later started a rhythm and blues band called The Loved Ones. It's not only the tall buildings that make the city, there's also the people. Sometimes just one individual that personifies a certain time and place. Decades drift by and the skyline changes. The significance of his presence amongst us back in the 60s doesn't just linger, it magnifies. It was over 30 years ago he entered our world, blew up a storm, but then abruptly disappeared, seemingly without trace. Where did he go? Was he a jazzer or was he a rocker? What did he do with all that talent? An aging fan ponders the likelihood of Jerry returning to revive the local music scene. Or is it all just ancient history? Is making a film about some forgotten figure from the 60s worth the candle? Should he finish the pizza? Does anyone really care? Of course they do. That's the point. There's people all over town who feel much the same, who wonder whatever happened to Jerry Humphreys. Here's Roger dreaming about something or other. He was a big fan. And Gordon Doby, who knew him from the kickoff. When first came to Melbourne, it would have been in the early 60s, I think, and I met him at the Riata Coffee Lounge where he was working as a waiter. And all he owned was the clothes he stood up in and his clarinet. And uh, the clarinet was in hock more often than not. Whenever he had a gig, he used to borrow my clarinet. But it was 1959, he'd only fairly recently arrived in Melbourne from England, as I understood. He may have been in Sydney beforehand, I'm not sure. Um, he played clarinet, and I talked about sort of the history of jazz, waxing very lyrical because I was very fond of jazz. And um, he then went to Sydney, where he recorded with, uh, or he played at a place called The Troubadour with Keith Vincent Smith, whose poems this would be a year later, like 1960 and early 61, I was doing Keith's poems here in Melbourne when I had a regular poetry and jazz session once a week at the Jazz Centre 44, no longer in existence, unfortunately. Um, and Jerry seemed to me to be, you know, a typical kind of jazzer. There were a number of English, German and Scottish people in the trad jazz scene in Melbourne at that time, and he seemed like any of the others. I remember Riata Cafe in 1960. It was very much part of Melbourne's music scene, which was quite small but diverse. Um, and it was, um, you know, glittering sort of um, candles on in Chianti bottles and uh, folk singers such as Martin Wyndham Reid. And it was listening to the wonderful improvisations of Jerry Humphreys on his clarinet. And um, it was the first time I'd ever heard such wonderful love music when I heard him play at Riata. I went down there with my washboard and uh, Jerry was playing on the stairs of this little coffee lounge, which later became the Green Man, um, with uh, a banjo. He was playing on the stairs, just with banjo, rain and bright. So I joined them on the washboard for a few songs. And um, I was absolutely knocked down with Jerry. He, he had uh, a sort of a Johnny Dodds tone, which was unusual in those days. Most of the English clarinet players had a sort of George Lewis sound. And uh, Jerry had this very bluesy New Orleans sound, but it wasn't a George Lewis thing. And it suited the onions superbly, the whole thing. He played beautifully. And uh, <clears throat> he said he'd join the band as long as he could have his, his uh, banjo player, Rainer. 
so uh, they joined the band. So, in 1962, what a rewarding confluence of talents it became with Alan Brown, Brett Eagledon, Bill Howard, Kim Lynch and others playing venues like the Ormond RSL, the Beaumaris Yacht Club, or off the back of a trailer. learning experience for us. Apart from Jerry's wonderful playing and singing, he was three years older than us. And this was uh, really important to have someone who'd lived all around the world and um, sort of understood a lot of stuff that we didn't understand. And he was, uh, he was a very uh, charismatic person and inspired us in things other than music. Um, he was very funny, he was a great storyteller and uh, sometimes I mean, you'd wonder because he'd tell you stories of, of his life one week which perhaps a month later might be different but uh, especially on the microphone he was very funny with his stories and he had an incredibly fertile imagination apart from musically. It was obvious that he had some technical problems with the clarinet but he overcame them with his sheer musical talent. Um, he obviously, a lot of his finger positions weren't normal. You could see his fingers curling in strange ways when he was trying to get notes, but his intonation and his sound was wonderful and his time, and um, he was a great improviser. Apart from being a great storyteller and a great leader of style in the band, um, even in the area of our awakening lives in, uh, of the world, understanding of the world, Jerry was important because he'd been working, well, from what he told us, he'd been on ships and he'd done all these incredible different jobs. And we were really middle class guys, I mean, with uh, soft backgrounds. Uh, uh, we hadn't really travelled anywhere. And um, so I guess in, in our own personal rite of passage, Jerry was, a very, was very, very important, certainly in mine. This is a little song that uh, Jerry taught us. At the Sydney Jazz Convention that Christmas, the Red Onions were a sensation with their unique brand of high energy playing and wacky verbs. Paul's gonna sing a little song. Don't you worry, don't take too long. Well, it's tied like that. It's tied like that. Hey, hey, I'm in the tide like that. I met a girl, she's six foot wide. I laid her down upon the side. And it's tied like that. It's tied like that. Hey, hey, I'm in the tide like that. I don't dig you, Mr. Neal. You can't ride in my automobile unless you wipe it off. Wipe it off. Hey, hey, you better wipe it off. Now, I don't dig you, Mr. Bud. You dropped my parcel in the mud. You better wipe it off. You better wipe it off. Listen to me, don't think you any better wipe it off. Yeah. jazz legend who was there that year, Ken Collier, described them as two-beat calculated madness. Hey, get that goat out of here.
the years that followed came regular work, recording sessions and TV appearances, and an ever-increasing legion of fans. There was a there was a distinctive Melbourne bohemian push. It was the the Sydney had the libertarians, and they were the they were sort of they, they, they were not beatniks, they were, they were, but they were they were they were true bohemians, and they were folk singers and they were artists and they were musicians, and they were all broke, and they all lived on the fringe somewhere in ratty houses in Carlton and and the inner suburbs St Kilda and old ballrooms and things like that. And there was a gallery, for instance, in St Kilda called the East Side Gallery that would have a party that started at midnight every Friday. And Jerry introduced, I can remember Jer Jerry introducing me to that. I went down there and Adrian Rawlins would always be at these things with a troupe of musicians that he'd gather up, including some from the Red Onions, who'd go around and play at these gigs at art galleries and coffee lounges and and it was all very intense it was very in, it was a very intelligent push and Jerry had Jerry was um, Jerry had had uh, a certain style that came from that it was a uh, it was a gypsy sort of um, thing I guess at that stage I was working as a clerk um, and all the other guys had various jobs like that we were working to live whereas Jerry was just playing he used to live on the beach. I remember quite a bit of time he'd sleep on the beach in Beaumaris after gigs because he, he didn't have anywhere to go. Um, he'd sleep all around the place, often at, um, down in Beaumaris at Brett's because they had a big house. But he was always running out of money and he was always up to um, various scams. But certainly nothing illegal, you know. He was a larrikin. Uh, in a way, he was a great larrikin. The band was playing Delta jazz, early New Orleans jazz, two-beat jazz, and I think Jerry introduced a stream of European medieval influence, uh, folk music, Celtic, minor key, laments, that sort of thing. He used to hang out with <clears throat> folk singers in Melbourne, Martin Wyndham Reid, Trevor Lucas, Glenn Tomasetti, uh, who were all steeped in that music. And, and Jerry introduced this sort of dark stream into the sort of fairly optimistic, happy, uh, upbeat, New Orleans jazz that we were playing at the time. It was an interesting mix. Uh, I was in love with the Red Onions. They were like the Beatles to me. I used to go see them about once a month. My folks would drive me there and leave me there at the Onion Patch in Oakley. Uh, and then when I was in fourth form, uh, I got a job at the Planet Lamps factory just to be uh, just to be around Jerry and uh, Alan Middleman, who was playing banjo in Jerry's band. And, uh, you know, we, I can't really remember much about it, but we were sit, just sitting in a line, you know, assembling planet lamps. That's about all I remember. Uh, they left after a week and then I was stuck there and I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, Jerry was always just this fascinating character because he was... Uh, <laughs> he was very funny with that, you know, some people are just funny, they are funny, you know, Jerry wasn't an actor, he was just a very funny man. That... The Red Onions were definitely a family, we did everything together. Um, the one person that didn't always fit in with the family, of course, was Jerry. He was older and he had, as I said before, he had very, to us, sophisticated friends and girlfriends. So in a way, we were a family but Jerry wasn't so much part of it. Um, he was more part of it when Claire came along because we were all at his wedding and all that and he got married at Brett's house and all that. I remember that so clearly. That first magical meeting, it was at uh, Tattersall's Hotel in Russell Street. I'd previously seen Jerry at um, Emwood Hill Theatre 
on Sunday afternoon playing flute, uh, accompanying Glenn Tomasetti and Sebi Jurgensen. And I thought that he was the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen in my life. The earth moved. And I was very embarrassed because I was worried that my feelings would show on the outside because I was getting chills up and down my spine. And obviously he'd spotted me somewhere else because uh, the feeling was mutual because when we first did meet actually at Tattersall's Hotel, he said, the first thing he said to me was, I'm going to marry you. And although I didn't answer him, I knew that that would be the case. And we were uh, living together within a couple of weeks and we were married within about four months. So it was very much meant to be. Uh, we were each other's soulmate, I guess. We actually had our honeymoon before we got married. We, uh, we eloped up the East Coast and hitched all the way up to uh, Cairns, I think we went as far as, and stopped off doing jobs on the way. It was beautiful in those days because it was 62 and nobody was around. I mean, I was 15 at the time and uh, 16 and uh, we would swim naked on those beautiful northern beaches and we weren't bothered by anybody we had a wonderful blissful three months of traveling in a way that you can't do now i mean it's much more dangerous now and of course i'm not 16 anymore nor is he 22. Despite their popularity, Jerry's work with the Red Onions barely made a living. Rock and roll was in the ascendancy. The amplified guitar was everywhere. In 1964, the Beatles toured Australia and were making spectacular money. A year later, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones were packing them in. Then late in 1965, three of the Red Onions left jazz forever. Kim Lynch, Ian Klein, and Jerry formed a rhythm and blues band, The Loved Ones. The Red Onions enlisted fresh talent and kept going for another 20 years, but the pain of that separation has never really gone away. I guess when Ian and Jerry uh, and Kim left, uh, we were all in a bit of a, a slack period anyway because the Beatles had come along and really all their jobs had collapsed pretty much overnight. I remember we, in fact, for a strange thing for a jazz band, we had a fan club with quite a few members. And the fan club was there one day and then a month later it didn't exist because in the interim the Beatles had come along. It sounds crazy, but the only reason we were popular, I'm quite sure, was that we, we fitted uh, an idea that the kids had for a cult band. It had nothing really to do with our music. It was more to do with the way we looked. And then when a rock band came along or a, with a similar look, they weren't interested in a silly band playing music from the 20s, not, not in any big way. And Jerry and Kim and Kleine realised that and they wanted to make something out of music and 
they were, I'm sure Jerry was drawn to that blues music and I'm sure Ian Klein always was. I don't think he was ever really committed to any jazz thing and time has proved that. He hasn't done any jazz before or after his time with us. Um, neither has Kim. I think they were all drawn to the performance thing and uh, so they went their own way. The Red Onions were a very close band but they were also very much um, around the Eagledon family and I think that they were very upset when the band broke up. In fact I know they were and they wouldn't speak to particularly Ian I think for a long time because he, he orchestrated the whole breakup. Well he orchestrated the three of them leaving and uh, so he was very much on the outer. Jerry was still working at the Eagledon factory so he must have got on well with them. That was his, um, still his main income for a long time. Making planet lamps. Making planet lamps, yeah. And he was reaching the dizzy heights of foreman of the line. <laughs> and then he'd go off. They were very understanding because the whole family was immersed in jazz. And so if he went off, they just let him go. And when he came back, they said, here's your job, you yeah, know, back on the line. It's a long time ago. And I th for me, the breakup of the Red Onions was I was a bit impatient to get out of the Red Onions, uh, speaking personally, because the Red Onions were moving into a period of jazz that I was not too fond of, which was up into the late 20s, into the 30s. It was starting to get a bit smooth and a little bit sort of mainstream in the sound. The musical tastes were changing. I liked the bluesiness of the old Delta jazz, and I think Jerry did, and I think Ian did. And I don't think any we were too happy with the direction it was going in. And I think that's probably what led to the, the, the attraction to rhythm and blues, because rhythm and blues had some of the earthiness of the early jazz that we that we were attracted to initially. With the old the old early Bessie Smith, King Oliver, that sort of thing, you know, the wailing quality, the the sort of really really sort of street quality of it and 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 there was something in the rhythm and in the rhythm and blues as translated by the english musicians that you're hearing eric burden and so on that was very appealing that had something in common with this and that was the attraction there was a, there was a lure there was a very it was a big, it was becoming very alluring to start playing that sort of music ian scored a recording date he, he told WMG that uh, we'd be in on, you know, on Tuesday. And to their surprise, the loved ones turned up instead of the Red Onions. It was, <laughs> it was, <laughs> he pulled a bit of a stunt with that. So they got a hell of a shock at WMG because they were pretty conservative. They were recording the Seekers and the Red Onions and uh, I think they recorded Frank Ifield originally before he went to England. And um, so we turned up with this number and two to rehearse for it, we played Blueberry Hill, which we could do pretty well. And uh, and Ian had got this guy along who was playing in a club band who had uh, one of those far feeser organs. And we all looked at it pretty sort of dubiously. And it turned out to be a good thing. And this guy also said, oh look, it's a sort of a three, four feel with the chords over a three bar pattern. So you get dum, da dum, dum. Then you add it comes to nine, you get repeat again. But I wanted it to have this sort of dun, 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 backing on it. So we did that, but this guy said, why don't you put the hand claps in because people are going to get lost. And so that's how we got the hand claps that was due to this organist from the Winston Charles. And um, that turned out to be a big feature of the whole thing.